Hello, Sermon Brainwave listeners and viewers. This is Matt Skinner. I'm inviting you to join Caroline, Joy, and me on a retreat next summer so we can explore together the craft of preaching. The three of us will take to the road to host this preacher's retreat, July 29 through August 2, 2024, at the Ghost Ranch Retreat Center. It's located in the remote and beautiful high desert north of Santa Fe, New Mexico, in the awe-inspiring terrain that Georgia O'Keeffe painted. As we're all together in residence at Ghost Ranch for four nights, our program will include presentations, panel discussions, corporate worship, lectionary-based Bible overviews, small group discussions, and preaching workshop exercises, all designed to enhance your gifts as a biblical preacher. You'll meet colleagues in ministry and feed your soul in a contemplative and sacred landscape. To get more information and to sign up, you can find a link on Working Preacher's homepage, or you can go to ghostranch.org, click on Workshops and Retreats, and type Working Preacher into the search box. The program cost is $350 per person. In addition, Ghost Ranch has different kinds of lodging options available for you to purchase, depending upon what kind of a retreat accommodation you desire. There is a cap on enrollment at 75 participants, and limited scholarship funds are available through Ghost Ranch. So sign up today. I hope you will join us there for this unique opportunity. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. The readings for the 18th Sunday after Pentecost for, which falls on October 1st in 2023, are Ezekiel chapter 18. We'll be reading verses 1 through 4, and then toward the end, 25 through 32. The uh, alternative first reading is Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. Our psalm is the 25th psalm, verses 1 through 9. We'll continue reading in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, and we'll continue with those parables in Matthew 21, reading verses 23 through 32. So we're, we're definitely in continuous mode. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I think it's in, uh, helpful to remind our, us that we're in we are we've changed locations or we're now in Jesus is in Jerusalem the triumphal entry into Jerusalem was 21 1 through 11 and so and and then you're reminded of that uh in verse 23 when he entered the temple mm -hmm. so therefore he's in Jerusalem <laughs> and that setting itself is i really critical for this parable and then the two parables that follow uh, because you know this question of by what authority are you doing these things when you're standing in the temple <laughs> with the <laughs> temple authorities and and that really uh when if that's another way to look at these parables i think coming up the this parable that's included here and then we have the parable of the wicked tenants and the parable of the banquet is is the way in which they are revealing what kind of authority not just by what authority but what kind of authority is is Jesus demonstrating or what kind of what do we mean by authority when when our usual categories of what authority means are being challenged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that in and of itself is a worthwhile mm, pursuit, homiletical mm -hmm. pursuit to, to kind of get people to think about how do we define authority? What does authority look like? Uh, what are different ways of understanding what authority is? What is authoritative for our lives? And so, and and by what authority <laughs> is by what authority is Jesus operating? How might we define that? And so that's that's the first that's the first entry point for me is recognizing that location and how that location really draws your attention to the question of authority. And, and yeah, 
And a reminder uh, that we said last week um, that in these different locations, to these different audiences, in a different way, Jesus is communicating a similar message that is countercultural, that is not what people would expect. So, you know, asking the question of authority when Jesus is speaking in the temple, um, that's definitely going to be a countercultural conversation. <laughs> so, so remembering that the similarity of conveying the same thing um, and the uh, dissimilar reality um, um, that, that to use my, Matt's words from last week, that might just be absurd. So I want to talk about the parable that, that comes after it. So the, the first half, the first paragraph here is familiar from Mark and you know, it's, it's, uh, we're gonna see this in, in all the synoptics, but the, the parable is only in Matthew. And as parables go, it's relatively easy. <laughs> <laughs> only three characters, but you know, and it actually, they right. actually get the answer, right? Yeah. But then Jesus's response is, is interesting. Um, you know, you didn't believe John, he came in the way of righteousness the losers in your field of vision, you know, your point of view, you know, um, believe John. The question then is what does belief look like? Because the, the parable talks about obedience and doing something right. Work in the field. I'll go work in the field. Belief is slightly different, right? So that the terms change a little bit when Jesus talks about it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, he, and so he doesn't say John came and everybody cleaned up their behavior, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but people believed him or people associated him. And even Jesus in his own ministry in Matthew, when he hangs out with the quote unquote tax collectors and sinners, we're never told that he says to them, quit your jobs, clean up your lives. I mean, the only people that he takes to task for specific sin to the religious leaders and it's their hypocrisy and their mm -hmm. burdening of people. I don't want to read too much into the silences, but it's really interesting that it's not, I think we want to be careful of reading the parable solely as about morality in the sense of some people get their lives together and do exactly what God wants them to do. And some people don't because he's talking to the, he's talking to the righteous folks here and, you know, and there's, so something's going on here where he's, I think, slightly subverting the whole idea of what does obedience to God look like? It might just mean to be a recipient of God's mercy, as opposed to here's my list of things I've done, you know, on behalf of the kingdom. Um, I don't want to divide belief and action too strongly, but you know, does that make sense what I'm getting at? It's just, it's curious to me that what what he's asking people to do to use language of the parable isn't burdensome mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nor but is it there, to clean up the losers to make them like the pretty righteous people you know what i mean right right but there is uh an expectation um that it it goes beyond just head knowledge correct that it, it goes beyond yeah so um there um, and and in some ways I'm looking ahead uh, at 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 the parable we'll be reading next week. But the um, that the reality of the religious leaders are supposed to be the ones that you can look to. And okay, so maybe they are saying they believe these things, and they are even telling other people to do things. But we have a recognition, as you said that their actions don't match those words. And it is the hypocrisy that uh, Jesus is bothered by. Um, so maybe not, maybe there is uh, an integrity to saying, I'm not sure what I believe right now, but I wanna hear from you, God. I wanna listen, can I follow? And Jesus respects that, you know, the so-called losers, because they're seeking. And I think there's a text somewhere that says those who seek will find. I don't know. I heard that somewhere before. I, I think know. it's even in this book. Uh, wow. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> but th there seems to be an honoring of that responsive action, even if 
to use your words, Matt, they aren't quite cleaned up in the way we would say, look like me because I'm clean. Are you? Yeah. Yeah. That's great, Joy, about the, especially about the like not having it all together, not fully knowing what I believe. This is also the gospel where people will gather around Jesus to hear the Great Commission simultaneously believing and doubting. Yes. <laughs> um, as they're commissioned to go out and make disciples and, you know, transform the world. So it's, and it's also the gospel where Jesus will say, you have little faith, not in a, you morons kind of tone of voice, I don't think, but a, in a, in a fostering, in a, in a generous. So, it, so yeah, it's a gospel that recognizes the difficulty and isn't asking for anything especially heroic. Just go in the field like I asked you to do. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the other uh, the other point uh, of connection here uh, it's not the same it's not the same verb but it can be translated the same uh, and that is you know you did not change your minds uh, and so we get we get that uh, we get that twice in this passage in um, in verse twenty nine. And then in verse, um, and then in verse thirty-two, and it's it's not the same verb as repentance from the beginning of the of the of the book, but there is this. It's metamelomai, so it's this transformation of of mind, and mm -hmm. and so that that I, that 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 change of of perspective or that changing of your mind. Um, as we've been talking about already, is not just it's not just a head thing. It 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 is. Then how does that then get embodied in your behavior? And and so I think that that's really helpful to make that connection too with believing, right? Mm -hmm. To believe, and, and particularly when believing is also so much in our common common talking about it is so much about what you adhere to or what you believe in your mind mm -hmm. when believing here is this is really kind of ac acting out that changed mind um and following through with that you can't just simply say oh i believe and then <laughs> there has there has to be something that follows follows that and 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 th this is just really helpful any and we say this all the time when we when we podcast on Matthew but the importance of of continually going back to the sermon on the mount and just that just to remember that the sermon on the mount is really <laughs> always behind everything that Jesus says and uh and you you know you are the light of the world you are the salt of the earth nobody's going to see the light if you just sit there and oh my mind's changed <laughs> yes <laughs> you know so, yeah 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 i think of a uh, uh, a fellow in one of the congregations that i served um he came to me when i first um uh, started being their pastor and he said just want you to know um i'm never going to be one of those hand raising um uh knee praying, Bible toting, scripture quoting Christians. Um, <laughs> and it was like, okay, right. Uh, forget everything my evangelism t t teacher taught me because this one is not interested. Um, and yet he started, um, literally he started having conversations with me about what I believed and why I believed it. And, and they were for a long time, very intellectual, very, um, um, uh, intellectually uh, stimulating, combative uh, <laughs> in that way. Um, and then one day he decided to stop reading all of the books that I was giving him and just read the Bible. And uh, he literally changed. Um, they recognized the shame in his home. They recognized the change at work. And that's how he found out about it, is that a guy at work called him a Christian. And he went home from work that day and said, honey, to his wife, this guy called me a Christian. And it was because he had become a different person. He had not made a confession of faith, but the word of God was, I, I always describe him as a man of integrity. And the word of God was 
not just what he was beginning to say he believed, but it was definitely becoming what his practices adhered to. And it was noticeable. And I think that's what Jesus is is relishing here. You yeah. know, the people whose behavior is noticeably uh, changed. Great story. Okay. I get the opposite. I go to work and people ask me if I'm a Christian or not. So <laughs> Just kidding. We all work at a seminary. People, right? That, it's right? people who okay. are not going to ask you, Matt. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Ezekiel. Yes, it uh, is. Yes, it yeah. is. Yeah. How do we want to? How do we want to bring that in? I mean, the connection is this. I mean, I just I went through and underlined how many times the word unfair is used. <laughs> 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 uh, which is a lot. Yes. And so that, again, it connects with some of the, um, you know, that, the, again, those expectations of, of God and, and the expectations of the kingdom. And, uh, and how do we, how do we define fairness and what are, what are those expectations around what's fair? And so that this is my, First observation with this passage. Echoing that unfairness uh, that we read about in several of the uh, options of passages last week. Um, and this, this uh, if choosing to, to preach this text behind that, um, I read it not only with the echo of, of last week's, but also uh, having revisited the Ten Commandments and particularly the, the commandment that says, uh, I am a jealous God, uh, punishing to the third and fourth generation um, the children of those who, um, uh, the interesting thing is it says those who reject me. Um, but uh, I, I noted how often we in our disenchanted imagination will say that God is unfair and here's proof. And that particular portion of that commandment appears to be perfect proof until you put it back in its larger context. And in its larger context, the next says, um, um, punishing those who reject me, but to the thousandth generation, showing uh, mercy to those who love me and keep my commandments. And having just looked at that, reading this Ezekiel uh, passage and, and also the commentary, which notes this isn't a new idea in Ezekiel. It is in the Mosaic law written uh, in, in Deuteronomy. Um, but what does it mean to think of God who is saying, I love you this much? And would you stop saying that I'm doing all of this punishment and attend to the fact that I'm extending all this grace. So this is a passage that I think uh, the preacher needs to read in its larger context uh, before getting caught on those one words that would affirm some of the doubt that we might have right now and turn that into what, uh, what uh, our friend Jennifer Brooks says, uh, preaching good news all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I sat with this text for a while, and like, what am I? What are we going to say about this this year? Because um, it's, it's it's tough. And historically, I'm kind of thinking about Ezekiel, where Ezekiel is located, and kind of what what's new being discovered about God here. But then, what was super helpful actually was the uh, the commentary uh, by Lisa Wolf, uh, both where she talks about that uh, that God's judgment is not a threat to God's mercy. These are not incompatible things. And we'll want to keep that in mind moving forward in Matthew in the next several weeks. But also um, the verses that are skipped over by the lectionary here, what, what obedience to God is about. And so again, it's not about this kind of moral rectitude in terms of like, this is what the respectable people do or something. It's it's uh, it, Well, I'll read what she wrote, right? Entails care for the poor, hungry, and needy. Uh, an unjust society neglects its most vulnerable members. This is also huge in Matthew. And so it's, it's again, it's God laying out, here's the way of life. Why will you die? Why will you choose death over this? Yes. And it's, my point is, it's not like it's uh, an individual moral improvement plan as much as it's, 
this is the kind of society I want for you and you all can play a part in this. And so that kind of urging, I think is really important because I do think we often hear language of divine punishment and we think that's what I'm going to get exposed as an individual and, and punished as an individual. And um, it's a bigger, it's more complicated than that, right? So how a preacher guides folks into a text that otherwise sounds really, really scary and kind of awakens a lot of uh, religious demons and people's uh, memories of well, bad scary. sermons or bad churches. A bad Christian. There's a thing as a bad church. <laughs> I think there is. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's for yeah. another podcast. That's for another podcast, but I'm with you on that one. Yeah. 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 It's holding on to that last verse as we talk about the character of God. For God has no pleasure in the death of right. anyone. Yeah. Turn then and live. Stanley right. Harwas and Will Willimon say that um, the way that the ways of God are to be witnessed by all the world is when they are embodied by Israel. Um, and I, I would stretch that to say that the, the grace and goodness of God is um, evident in all the world when the people of God embody the practices of justice and righteousness that you were speaking about, uh, uh, Matt, that will always be countercultural. And the litmus test is life. Does it give life? The litmus test is life. Does it lead to life, right? That's, that's a whole nother, you know, that's a whole nother direction. That'll preach. Yeah. But does it lead to, um, does that embodiment lead, lead to life? And that's something that uh, that we all need to ask ourselves in terms of our practices and what we hold on to and how, who we are as leaders and who we are as believers is, is, are we, are we, uh, do we recognize that wish of God and that, and that, as you were talking, joy, that central characteristic of God, God is, our God is about giving life. And, and if we're not about giving life, then are we really believing as we were talking about early, earlier? Yeah. And in that society that Matt describes, it's not just life for me. Mm -hmm. It's not just life for yeah. my tribe. It's yeah. life for everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Exodus 17, one through seven is a bit more of the. <laughs> the murmuring, quarreling. The murmuring cleaning world. I, I thought it was, um, I'm trying to find it now in the commentary, but oh yeah, where the two places, the uh, Massa and Meribah, yeah. uh, that Victor Hamilton translates it as testing bill and complaining Berg. Yeah. <laughs> I love that too. That yeah. Was yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. That's worth the price of buying his book, just to that, I think, right there. Yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, uh, again, uh, uh, a similar scene to what we've uh, already seen. This is uh, um, not uh, a one-stop fix-it. Um, when God is transforming, um, uh, as you uh, share it with us, that word, uh, uh, um the meta word that I don't know my Greek, so I can't repeat it, Caroline. Um, but uh, the transformation that God is asking of us, God is gracious and patient and not expecting it to happen immediately. Um, and can we be like that? Because God has just provided food, um, not to mention that God has just you know, part of the Red Sea destroyed Egypt, uh, yeah. taken it. You know, I mean, God's kind of shown yeah. up and shown out. And the last time they complained to God, God provided. And now, you know, I get it. They've gone around to another couple of exit, and there's no Starbucks, and they're upset, and they start <laughs> complaining all over again. Um, um, yeah. Um, it, yeah. It, it, and it is, um, it is worth noting. Um, uh, um, and I'm going to have to look this one up to make sure I'm at the right text because I didn't write the zip code here. Um, but where they stop is just around the bend from where they would have found a stream. <laughs> 
Well, there's this beautiful, I, I, I forgot exactly where it is. I think it might be in the rabbinic literature. Um, but I think it's already in circulation when Paul writes this idea of the rock follow them around for a while to mm -hmm. keep feeding, to keep giving them water, um, uh, which is a beautiful image. But it's it's again. I mean, last week I think we talked about in the provision of manna and some religious the, the religious trauma. Who is this God? Is this God trustworthy? We don't know. got this Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, what what are we going to become? Uh, and the law is about to be given, which is going to help them become a nation and all of that. But here it's uh, first and foremost, before God is a lawgiver, God is a, a nurturer, God is a the feeder. Oh, thank you for that. Whom God gives of God's own self, right? And this is the most fundamental form of nurturing another creature, whether it's one's child um, from one's own body, from one's own sustenance, whether it's animals, I mean, all of these things in terms of just basic if, if god cannot provide food and water for these people god does not deserve their worship in a sense right because god's not trustworthy as a nurturer and so it's interesting that israel has to learn that lesson so to speak i mean a good lesson before they can even think about law or nationhood and things like that which is really centralized in that question right of is the lord among us or not uh, and I, I know we've talked about that before, but every time this text comes around um, and I, I I look at that, I experience that question differently. Um, is the Lord among us or not? And, and the way in which we ask that in our personal lives, um, depending on what we're experiencing in our, in our personal lives, but then also also uh, to what extent are are we ask that as as congregations or as uh, institutions of the church like the seminary like our seminary right yeah. luther seminary is the lord among us or not uh is what we're doing uh, uh that we that we recognize that that this is <laughs> this is we're doing the lord's business um so I say that not as a question of is uh, is the Lord among us, but uh, kind of uh, a, a a statement of is is do you really believe that the Lord is among us or not? Do you believe that what we're up to is actually, <laughs> you know, uh, it, believing embodying the Lord's business, or or, or and, and and is that even recognizable? Uh, or have we adopted other um, other kingdoms yeah. that make us not even recognizable as a as as doing kingdom work? And I think and so and a con and a pastor might ask that mm -hmm. question of 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 their congregation: Is the Lord among us or not? Uh, uh, as an inquiring question, but also to say, do you believe that the Lord is among us? Um, it goes back to for me. It I am always. It goes back to the, which is always thought to be, and we talked about this, you know, a number of weeks ago. But the comforting verse of Matthew, uh, you know, where two or three are gathered, I am there among us. Well, that's oh, what a nice thing. You know, God is with us. Jesus is with us when we're all gathered together. Except, do we really th do we really recognize that we're in a council meeting and we're attacking each other? Or we're in a faculty meeting and we're, you know, do you what if what if you actually thought that Jesus is sitting at the table right next to you? Yeah. Um, what if you actually thought that, believe that the Lord is among us? So I think it really raises a lot of questions about leadership and about um, uh, that that trust. Um, that trust of not only from a place of 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 pain and 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 abandonment, but it really a place of of responsibility and accountability. That's a challenge for a congregation to be asked. Mm -hmm. it, isn't that exactly what a leader is supposed to do? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This yep. is where where it, it moves from what we know to how we believe and live out. Um, yeah. What is interesting to me is what how they would answer, right? Yes or no. What what's more interesting to me is how would you go about being able to answer that question? Like what what would you look for to give you an affirmative answer? Like what's what how's your congregation learn to think 
theologically and what's what are you looking for in terms of evidence but i'm gonna yeah. jump to the psalm because i just have one thing to say about it well let, can, yeah. I, can i can jump you use here? this liturgically do you think <laughs> <It's good. laughs> is that your answer this year or this week that's just a question I, I, it's, I, I have this hunch that this might be a psalm that that i could figure out how to use liturgically but i want to know if that's okay uh, absolutely is it yeah okay I never get to say that. Everybody else always says that. <laughs> so you wanted to get in there and get it right. Yes. It teaches people how to pray. Yes. It does. At least the yeah. first seven yeah. verses. Absolutely. I think that's great. And yeah. um, I, I don't I don't mind not having my, my youthful sins uh for uh remembered. I used a double <laughs> negative there. That was hard. Um, yeah. that I, I'll yeah. keep playing that too. <laughs> It's the ones in my middle age also. It's all of them, really. I would, I would isn't add that in. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? Well, given, given some of the themes that we've picked up already with our, with our passages for this week, though, uh, verse 4, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your past. Lead me in your truth. You know, how often we need to pray that um, and on a really, really regular basis. <laughs> uh, that's I, that's how I would make the connection too. That you know, is the Lord among us or not? Is uh, one of the ways you, you you talked about this, Matt? Like, how would you answer that? Well, one of the one of the ways of answering that is to say, do we regularly pray that the Lord is mm. leading, that we are being led by the Lord? Lead me in your truth. Sometimes, um, sometimes when we begin our prayers, we have a tendency to um, um, invite God into the space as if we showed up first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, that 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 uh, though I would I would I would think liturgically this would be uh, a beginning prayer and shifting the liturgy a little bit um, in a preparation for what the words uh, of the text would be. Um, and, and a, a theological answer for me, Matt, um, for your question, I've just reread uh, one of uh, Kate Bowler's books. And um, uh, this psalm uh, ends uh, with um, the, um, he leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. Um, that God's presence among us, uh, according to the text we've just read, is not more than I need, but minimally what I need. And that's what keeps us humble. Um, and are we willing to acknowledge that God is with us, not when we are the biggest and everyone notices us because of our, our grandeur, but notices us because there seems to be, well, a goodness that isn't seen somewhere else. Uh, and that that psalm, I think, prays that prayer, opens ourselves to God's goodness in that way. Philippians, very famous passage. Famous passage theologically, but yeah, I think I say this every time it pops up. But it's it's Paul doesn't say, "Hey, I'm going to teach you about the incarnation now." Um, right. Yeah. The, the theology comes in the service of Paul saying, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. And then he turns to Christ as the, um, the exemplar of that. So, which is, you know, before you dig in and want to like dissect this for, for your systematic theology class, help people see that. And then I think the commentary is really helpful in terms of talking about this isn't about suffering for suffering's sake. This is about yeah. a crucifixion. So you might want to teach people the word cruciform. Uh, Michael Gorman's a New Testament scholar who's yes. really, he's done a lot with that word talking about Paul and what he means by cruciform is simply means cross shaped. And so he yes. talks about a community that is cross shaped or a life that is cross shaped. Yeah. And by that, he just simply means that it's, it's, it takes its cues. It takes its shape. It takes its values and foundation from a crucified Mm -hmm. Jesus, mm -hmm. um, which for Paul is it's the center of everything. Paul can't get over the crucifixion. <laughs> um, for him, it's the mode of Jesus's death that teaches him something dramatic, I think, about God. So anyway, there's your seminary word to put in your sermon. Can you do that? You're the preaching professors. 
<laughs> Can yes. you do that? teach people the word cruciform? And I, I think the other thing that I really appreciated about the commentary, the commentary on the passage this year is that reminder that these are all plural commands, you know, discerning together, working out your, you know, your salvation, that this is a, a communal reality. And um, it, to, to live in this way and be in this way. And, uh, and again, you know, we were talking about last week, uh, how Philippians and at this particular point in a congregation's life could be a, a really words that they need to hear in terms of a reminder that we, uh, the reminder that we do this together in community. Um, and we do our believing, our working out, our salvation, our discerning. We can't do it alone. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we, why we are in church, come to church, part of church, part of a faith community, is that, that that essentialness of the communal process of believing.